two rather strenuous days in Petra and then into Luxor. And you do have another one coming up the day after tomorrow if you're going into Cairo and Giza to see the pyramids or the Egyptian Museum or whatever your choice is of, of excursions. You notice we have a center screen. Yeah. The gentlemen you can thank are, I'll, I'll give them both credit, Derek and Paul in the booth uh, for getting that in the now I do have to give you a caveat. <laughs> they have, they're having a little bit of problems right now. So it may disappear on us. But I also noticed how now we've moved to the center. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about today is not the history and not the construction of the Suez Canal. But rather what I want to talk about at this point in time would be how the canal operates. Most of the questions I formerly have gotten was, well, when are we going to see it? When are we going to see it? The when are we going to see it right now, I can't tell you because of the fact that the navigator doesn't know when we're going to be given permission uh, to leave our mooring. What the captain said was that at 3 o'clock in the morning, we have to be at our mooring point or our staging point where all of the ships will be. Then, they're, as you're going to see, they're going to form a convoy which is going to go through the canal. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that works. I'll show you some of the things you can see, give you some basic information. All right, let me some, give you some factoids, as I like to call about the canal. Uh, the canal is open to all ships, all nations, peace times, or war. This was the Constantinople Convention of October 29th, 1888. All right, so that basically says that no Navy, no merchant fleet can be denied passage through the canal. The length of the canal, I've seen so many different figures. I'll use 120 miles. You'll see 118, you'll see 119. So I'm going to go with that. Air draft is very important. That's the distance from the water line to the highest point on the ship. And why that's important is we have to pass under a bridge used to be called the Mubarak Bridge. You can be sure it's not called that anymore. Sometimes it's called the International Peace Bridge, and another name for it, and probably the more formal name today, would be the Egyptian-Japanese Peace Bridge, because it was a joint venture of the Japanese government, who bore a great deal of the cost, and the Egyptian government. Uh, transit speeds anywhere from 6.8 to 9.9 .9 miles an hour. Generally, it tends to be lower. When I went through in the fall, we went through it a little over seven knots at that point in time. Uh, one of the reasons, basically, is as the ship goes through, the, it pulls the water with it, and as it pulls the water with it, that pulls the sand on either side of the channel because the canal is basically dredged sand. And just to say now, there are no locks. This is not like the Panama Canal if you've been through the Panama Canal. There aren't any locks. So this is a straight run through. The maximum draft for a vessel currently is 66 feet. You'll see a diagram of the cross section of what the canal looks like. And the maximum beam, or the width of the ship, right now is 164 feet. So therefore, they cannot take every ship in the world through the canal. Uh, they can take a large majority. And they've been making the canal deeper and wider over time. They just, the last project for widening it was about 2010. And that took them to a maximum draft and beam that I show there. The next one is to get that down to 72 feet. The navigator, and of course the captain, will be using a series of navigational charts there to help them guide themselves through the canal. In addition to that, there will be four pilots that will come on board. One pilot will take us from the mooring in Port Suez to the beginning of the canal. A second pilot is responsible for guiding the ship and the captain through the canal all the way to Ishmalia. At that point, a third pilot will come on 
And that pilot will take the ship and help the captain guide it all the way to Port Said. At Port Said, then you would have the, the fourth pilot whose job basically is get you out of the harbor into open sea. How do you get the most number of ships through the Suez Canal when you're dealing with the problem of the width of the canal and the fact that only one ship can transit at a time? And they cannot pass. Well, the way you basically do that is you put in two bypass locations. The largest bypass location, and now I'm going to move over to the people on the right side. Just to be fair. And there we see the largest bypass location is the Great Bitter Lake. And, it's, and specifically, it's the largest one. The second one is at what's called the Balabai Pass. Now, to get the ships through, they run convoys. All right, They use a convoy system. So what we will do is we will queue up for the northbound convoy. Now, the northbound convoy is given precedent. Once it leaves, it starts, it goes directly straight through the Suez Canal until it reaches the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so we'll start here. Once we get going, we're going to go straight through. We're going to go right through Great Bitter Lake. We're going to go right past the Shimalia, right past the Bala by by Bypass, and probably come out at the lower one right here, into the Mediterranean, and then we'll go off and continue it to Alexandria. Now, people going southbound, they have two convoys. One convoy technically starts at midnight, and it can freewheel all the way to the Great Bitter Lakes. And at that point, those ships must moor in a space assigned to them. Now, when we go past the Great Bitter Lake, you will see those ships potentially on one side, sometimes on both sides, depending upon the traffic. We will start off sometime after 5, 6 in the morning. And that's very variable. The captain has no control about that. And that's why the navigator can't give me any times at this point. So when they let us go, we go straight through. So we start at 6, let's say 6 a.m. Over here, they're starting somewhere around midnight. Now, my experience coming southbound has typically been that about 1 o'clock in the morning, engine's up. Then, they, then the, the captain probably hits Port Said around 2 a.m. in the morning. All right. And again, free wheels. Now, that's the first convoy. So the timing is rather critical in terms of that. Now, there's a second convoy that leaves in the morning, late, much later in the morning. The second convoy travels all the way to the Bala Bypass, and it moors there. There's room for 15 ships. So you can see there is still is some limitation on how many ships can go through the canal. Now, let's continue the operation. We come from Port Suez. Once the last ship in our convoy leaves or gets a certain point in the Great Bitter Lake, then the Su Suez Canal Authority will release the ships that are moored there. They can then complete their journey to the Gulf of Suez. Then we will travel all the way here through Ishmalia till we get to the Bala Bypass. At the Bala Bypass, at that point, we're going to see some ships on the port side of the ship in the Bala Bypass. Once the last ship in our convoy, the northbound convoy, gets through, then they release those ships to go directly to the Gulf of Suez. We, of course, will continue our direction until we reach the Mediterranean. So that's how they can get the most number of ships in two directions through the canal.
by using that particular technique. All right. And the first thing you're going to see is Suez, Port Suez. And it will be coming in the lower section right down here, past the shipyards. And one of the first monuments you're going to see is a mosque on the left-hand side or the port side of the ship. And it's just an aerial view of a portion along the canal. And the first time I did this voyage, someone said, what are those little things there? And it didn't even strike me. But what they are, are military pontoons that you will see along the way as you travel. Usually will be on the left side. I've never seen them on the right. And they're there in the event of war. Security for the canal is, is provided by the Egyptian military. International Peace Bridge. It's probably the last significant thing you're going to see as you make your transit to the Mediterranean. As I said, it was a joint venture between Japan and Egypt. I'll give you some of the basic numbers. It was a Japanese grant. The Japanese accounted for 60% of the construction costs. The estimated cost to Japan was 13.5 billion yen. The estimated cost to Egypt, which represented 40% of the total expenditure, was 9 billion yen. The bridge was built by a Japanese company. It is a cable stay bridge. There you see a military vessel going towards it. It's 2.5 miles in length with two 1.1 mile approaches to it to go up to the height of the bridge. Uh, main span is about 1,325 feet. So finally we're going to come to Port Said. On the right hand picture you can see the separation. Again, we may very well go to the left and go past Port Said, past the cruise port, out to Alexandria, or we could go to the right. I've gone both ways on the northbound convoy. Fort Said, founded in 1859, again as part of the process of constructing the canal. It's at the north entrance of the canal. It's a major harbor today. Uh, population probably in the area of about 604,000, at least that was the 2010 census number. It could be up or down. Important harbor for exporting cotton, chemicals, processed food, and interestingly enough, cigarettes. It's both a duty-free port and a tourist resort area. So that is what you will be going through tomorrow. Just another couple of pictures in that area. I would like to thank you for coming today. If, if, if you will try to arrange some type of bridge information it may come from the bridge or it may come from the cruise director's office tomorrow. We're working on that now.